Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and today we are here with Jessica Schaub. Is that how you say your name? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, Jessica is a crystal child, is what she calls herself, mm -hmm. and we're really excited to be able to talk to her today. Um, so Jessica, tell me a little bit about yourself and um, kind of a little bit about your journey. And she's had a very interesting time growing up. And at this time, you're about almost 26. Is that right? Yes. OK. That's correct. OK. So why don't you tell me, um, like, when you, like, the early childhood kind of thing with the relationship with your father and how you sort of tapped into all of this? All right. Um, I was very, very shy growing up. I actually didn't fit in, surprisingly. Um, I didn't really have friends, but uh, my age, I actually did have a lot of grannies, which um, I adopted. I had 50, and they taught me how to knit and crochet and things like that. Um, I, um, I retreated a lot into cartoons, and um, it really came about when I was 16. That was the big um, trigger, if you will. Before that, though, I do remember saying things in school like angels are aliens and aliens are angels. But um, So you would say this in school? Yes. And, and what would be the reaction to the children around you? Oh, laughter, ridicule, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why would you say that? You know what? I really didn't know. Okay. Uh, it was almost like um, channeling, but I wasn't aware I was channeling. Okay. I just started sharing this information, and it was even before I even knew what was going on with my father. So, uh, just thinking back to it, that's kind of interesting and different. Uh huh. Okay. So, what happened then? I mean, I mean, obviously, this is what you did on the early days. How did you progress at that point? Because I know there's a part in which you actually kind of tried to reject that world. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, because when you first get into this information, it brings about an existential breakdown. You let go of everything you think you know about yourself and the world and everybody. So it is, in a sense, a little bit of a death and also um, a rebirth. You're an empty cup now, an empty vessel to be filled. Be a little more specific in terms of your, your experience, because I know that, that you had a tragedy in your, in mm -hmm. your life. But prior to that, because that happened kind of like in your late teens, yes. you had sort of a dilemma. So can you describe what your father was like and why and how that dilemma kind of came around in your life? Um, he was very distant. He um, was connected to a world that I wasn't familiar with at the time. And he spoke about things that I really didn't understand also. Um, but he was you know, very, very like, passionate and loving as well. But, um, sorry, I'm getting a little nervous. Um, well, I can, also, I can say beforehand, I was always a little bit suspicious in school. Um, I felt like I didn't like being taught what to think rather than how to think. That was always in the back of my mind. And um, also just, I kind of felt like I was coming off the assembly line. And um, I remember trying to um, uh, ask about Things that I, I noticed that there's just stuff I was, we weren't being taught about in school. For example, um, in grade eight, they were saying the only kind of matter is gas, solid, and liquid. And I raised my hand and I said, well, what about plasma? And you know what she said? Go to detention. Go to detention, really? Yeah. So. Um, Very interesting. Yeah. And you grew up in what, what area? Um, well, I was born in Winterpeg, but I left when I was seven. Mm -hmm. and um, the Vancouver area, the suburbs. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so you were told to go <laughs> to detention because you talked about plasma. Yes. And that's, you know, actually, I mean, so they, they actually didn't have any clue about that. And we're talking what year it, uh, approximately, do you remember? I was in um, grade eight, yes. Okay. Was the first year of high school. Okay. And I just started to realize, wait a second here, there's a lot they're not saying, and why can't we talk about it? Why do we get in trouble if we bring this stuff up? Okay. Right? So, so what happened after that? Um, I kind of disregarded it. Like, I didn't really pay too much attention to it. It was just always in the back of the brain. And it's almost like um, a detective. You're collecting all these bits and pieces as you go on the way. And um, 
still very blind. So we always, we have a trigger. And my trigger was when I was 16. Um, it was tragedy. My sister ended up passing away. And um, her friend was drinking and driving. And it was just my sister that went, so it was just her time. And Okay, and how did that affect you? I mean, obviously, you know, it's distressing and, and we don't have to dwell on it here. But at the same time, I think that it has something to do with your willingness to perhaps let in these other worlds. Would you say that? Yes, because I realized that um, I was very depressed at that time. And I was also very um, Christian thinking in the sense that I felt that you know, everybody who parties and does drugs and things like that is bad and I don't want to converse with them. I'm not saying all Christians think like that, but that was just the way my headspace was and my interpretation of that. So when she passed away and I was listening to her friends speak about her at the funeral, they were talking about this wonderful girl that I never got to know because I shut her out because I was very judgmental. So right then and there, I just vowed to myself that I was never going to judge people by what they did that wasn't who they really were. You know, it's just experiences that we come here for. Um, it was a very devastating time when my sister passed away in that it destroyed the family. My mother ended up getting worse, very bad migraines. I mean, she had migraines before, but they seemed to be more frequent and lasted longer and more severe. And my father ended up getting a stroke. And family broke apart. My brother went to a university. My other brother went to a foster home. Um, we became homeless. So it was a lot all at once. And um, I, th I think I just became very traumatized. You know, it, it almost didn't seem real. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, when, okay, you told me that your father had a big influence on... Yes your sort of letting ETs communicate with you. Can yes. you talk to me about that story? Yes, right after my sister passed away, my dad said, she's come back, and she started to speak to him. And she, start, she said that um, it's a very exciting time to be alive. Uh, the universe is like a big garden, there's lots of tending to. I've come back to let you know that certain members of the family have been called for a very specific mission. And um, she was like the introduction towards a whole bunch of other beings coming through. So after my sister started coming through the catalyst, then came angels, nature spirits, Ascended Masters, extraterrestrials, it just got really, really out there. <laughs> okay, when you say this happened, did this happen to you or did this happen to your father? This happened to my father. Okay. It all happened to my father first. So he was very open talking to you about this. Well, he was really shocked and taken aback, you know. It was exciting and he just had to share with the family because he didn't really... I don't know if he knew what to make of it at that time, but he knew that he needed to share this because it was a big thing to my sister. The interesting thing about that, how um, that she came back was mediums can only speak to um, people who've passed away if uh, they haven't crossed over. Mm -hmm. She had crossed over and then she came right back. Okay, when you say she came right back, what do you mean by that? Do you mean she was reincarnated in another body and, and coming to you from there or do you mean that she was in another dimension? She was in another dimension Okay. Yes, um, the fifth, and my dad described her as very, very bright white light being appeared to him, like an angel, and he said it, it was very much her personality, because she's like, look, Dad, Dad, I look pretty, <laughs> <laughs> like a girl would say, so, uh -huh. yeah, it was, you know, something you got to share, it's something really amazing happened. Okay, and what was your reaction when your father talked about this? I was very hurt, very upset, because she's passed away, you know, it's like jump, dumping salt on this wound, you know, it's ah, not very funny at all, Dad. You know, particularly because he had a stroke. And when he had the stroke, he didn't know who we were. He couldn't work, you know. I felt like I lost my father, and so now to talk about something like this, you know, you're crazy, you don't know what So he had about. these experiences after he had the stroke, is what you're saying? Yes, okay. so I thought. He must have recovered fairly well, though, to be able to communicate. I mean, he didn't have, 
like speech impairment or anything like that from the stroke? He did a bit, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he was able to communicate this to you? Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you rejected it in the beginning. Um, what made you change your mind? A lot of things. Uh, it was okay. not something that I was going to quickly be open to because I really, really wanted to be normal. <laughs> and it was never going to happen. Okay. I just had to. It took me a while to get to that. But um, he wanted to tell me about his experiences and all these beings that were coming through and what they were saying. And they were talking a lot about me. Okay. Um, and I did not know what to make of this. I really, really wanted nothing to do with it. And so I would just go to the library or the bookstore and um, books would start falling off the shelf with the same kind of context of information that um, these beings were speaking to my dad about. They'd fall right at my feet. And again, I was still very Christian thinking, so I'm like, this is a devil. So I would just run out, freaked out. and. Um, it's funny how, how did you get over that, though, if you, were such, if you had this mindset that was Christian thinking? How did you sort of move beyond that? Oh, I'll get into that. That's okay. coming up. Um, so I would just, you know, go walking down on the streets and people would come up to me, people I knew and people I didn't know, and they would hand me the books. Again, same kind of information, that would, like the ones that my dad was talking about, similar to the context of the books in the uh, library and bookstore. And uh, what's interesting about this is some of the people, when I asked, why are you giving me this book, of, you know, and they're like, I don't know. How do you not know why you're giving somebody a book unless you're being inspired? Okay. And uh, I still would not look at the books. Um, and so it required those beings to be even more persistent. I like to call it angelic kick in the butt where um, I was working, I've been working in the film industry right after my sister passed away. I left school because um, my parents, they were just, you know, they weren't able to um, work. So I decided that, you know, we go to schools, learn how to make money. Um, I'm out of school, I'm out of this. And I went into the film industry right away. Um, my very first day of extra work, I got lines. And so I thought that was normal. <laughs> the next day I'm like, when do I get my lines? And they're like, you don't. So. <laughs> um, where is, where is I so what that? happened, you, um, what did you do then? You didn't get lines, are you saying you just became an extra? I did extra work, I mm -hmm. did acting, I did stunts, I did stand-in, I did crew work, um, okay. set deck. I mm -hmm. did as many different things um, to remove um, politics and understand where everybody was coming from. That was something that I always was interested in doing is learning all the different perspectives and um, okay. And so when did the transition happen where you started to listen to what your father said? On set, on a show called Da Vinci's Inquest, a guy came up to me I've never seen in my entire life. And he said to me, is your name Jessica? And I said, mm-hmm. He said, is your last name Shaw? Yeah. And um, is your parents' name Roseanne and Terry? Yeah. How do you know all this? And he's like, okay, this is for you. And he gave me all these tapes on the CIA, underground militia, David Icke, Jordan Maxwell, Alex Collier, and then some. <laughs> okay. And um, it, I just kind of realized that this is never going to let up. Something is trying to get my attention, and I have to surrender. Did you watch those tapes? I did. Okay. And did it change you? Um, I became very, very depressed, even more so, because, again, letting go of everything you think you know, but then also it seems to be this huge, scary conspiracy, like we're doomed, it's, you know, this huge control game going on and there's nothing you can do about it because you don't have the power or, or the money or um, say, in a sense. Okay. Yeah. And so, what did you do then? How did you... How did you go from there to actually listening to your father? Well, after the videos and after feeling the way I did about them and just constant reoccurring of um, Pleiadians, you know, okay, Dad, who are the Pleiadians? Why do they want to get in contact with me? So I started finding out now, really listening to my dad. And I wasn't necessarily 
open to it, but I wasn't necessarily closed. I was just thinking that um, this is my experience for whatever reason life has taken this turn, and um, it's for a reason. So I should um, I should do some investigating. Okay, and how old were you at this time? Um, I'd say about 17, yeah, okay. a year later. And um, my dad actually started to talk about his experiences, that he actually was aware of this stuff before his stroke. It was just a bigger upgrade for him. But um, I found out that when he was eight, he was taken up on a UFO, and um, the whole family on the farm saw this as well. And uh, they put a chip in his brain, and um, this chip, uh, we didn't, he didn't believe that it was actually there. He thought it was a dream or something until uh, not too long ago, um, after, before his stroke, I believe, they mentioned, he was in the hospital, and um, there was a woman there that, well, she seemed to be a nurse, but she wasn't, because she went up to my dad right away, and she said, you have to leave. She brought him his clothes. She said, if they're planning on scanning your brain, if they scan your brain, they'll find the chip. And my dad's like, wait a second, that's real? And she said, this cannot happen. So come on, time to go. But my dad actually didn't get out on time. So right when they were about to scan his brain, the whole hospital had a blackout. And uh, when the power went back on, the, um, the, cat, the CAT scan machine didn't work. And then when it did work, it worked on everybody but him. And that gave him enough time to make his escape um, from the hospital. Okay, very interesting. So yeah. now this, this woman, did she disappear? Did she, was she still on the... Yeah, she disappeared. My dad went back to find um, you know, who, if he could speak to her again. And she was only there that one time. She completely vanished. Okay. And there's been a few, actually, events like that where um, these people would come to our door and my dad would say, Jess, go follow them. And I did, and they, they just vanished. They just right? vanished. Yeah. So he, he would right say, thin air. follow the them. And I'd see them, poof. Okay. And uh, my dad, he would have uh, experiences where he could see these beings all the time. He would be in a parking lot, and suddenly all these angels would be surrounding him. So he had many experiences like that, and he always tried to interpret it and, and explain it to us, which was very... Um, very fascinating it started to become, you know, okay, wow, something is going on here. And um, what did your father do for a living before he had a stroke? My father um, was a businessman. He had his own company called Beverly Hill Homes, which he ran with my mother, and it was very successful. And then he, he was a, a master of many things, a jack of all trades. He was he, in Winnipeg, he built houses. He designed them architecture-wise, and he also put it together, uh, carpentry. And um, they're very beautiful homes as well. One, um, which I have fond memories, is the Castle House. And uh, he also was a chemist. He invented bendable concrete. But because he was very um, honest and trustworthy, he ended up getting uh, taken, and somebody stole that idea and took it to China. And that really devastated my mother. They ended up losing all their money, um, really having nothing. And uh, then my father, through the latter years, he uh, made furniture, cutesy kind of furniture. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, so you, you're in this, this situation. Your sister has passed. Mm -hmm. You're learning about ETs. And what happened that actually sort of progressed you to where it wasn't just your father having experiences, but you started to have them? Okay. Wow. Um, well, while I start to learn about the ETs, I'm still, um, I'm actually really still upset with my father because he left the church and um, I was still kind of Christian at that time, right? Trying to hold on to this. And um, so I kept going to different churches and I felt really annoyed because I couldn't find one where I fit in. And so I decided to um, explore different religions. And I went to those churches, still didn't quite fit in, or something felt off and I couldn't put my finger on it. 
Uh, so then I went into mysticism, because this seemed to be along the lines of what my dad was talking about and what it seemed these beings were um, trying to relate to me. But still, that didn't quite feel right, and I didn't quite fit in. And I knew that to try to, I knew that one day I would be explaining this to people. Um, so I decided to even explore atheism. Again, same thing, still didn't quite fit in. But there's still, I couldn't deny any of them either, because they all seemed to be pieces of myself. So what I did was I started to embrace all of them. And I realized that I'm not just one, and to pigeonhole myself into one is a great disservice. Okay. So these new insights started coming through. This is really where I started to see the world very differently, and everyday little things started to become really big. For example, um, one time I came home and I was very upset about um, this reoccurring problem. Like, why does this keep happening to me? And uh, it's funny, I don't even know what it is to this day, so really big, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it popped into my head, Boggle. Go get the game Boggle. I'm like, huh? Boggle? What the heck does that have to do with anything? That's kind of a weird, random tangent. But I went and got it, and uh, then I got, you know, shake it up, find some words. And I found like 10. And I'm like, all right, well, that's done. I don't really understand the point of this. And uh, when I put it down, I uh, got up and I, I turned around and I saw the board from another angle. And I saw all these other words I didn't see before. And I'm like, wait a second. And I walked around and I saw you know, more from the other angle, more from the other angle. Till I found, I think, 55. And then... It said, okay, well, now you know why this problem keeps reoccurring. You're only looking at it from one perspective, one angle. I was like, oh my goodness, wow. And where did this come from? And then it just popped into my head. Allow us to introduce ourselves. We are your guides. Um, and every time I tried to ask them who exactly they were, I got a different answer. And so I thought at one point they were playing with me. But um, in a sense, they didn't want to be locked into labels. In the beginning, you know, you, we introduced myself as a crystal child. You know, there's indigo, light worker, star seed, and also just Jessica. Uh -huh. Right? So they're all labels. When it comes down to it, they're all pieces of ourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, in school, I was always told that I was stupid, and I believed it. Well, well when you say you were told you were stupid, who told you that? My teachers. I, why? Because mm -hmm. I was put in the special classes, oh. a slow learner, um, and the students, and because I was very dyslexic and I learned very differently, and I, okay. I couldn't, I didn't see things the way they did, and also I didn't have an interest to. It's just so boring, you know. This is not what, <laughs> this is not going to stimulate the soul, you know. It starves that part of us. Okay, so, but to get back to your story, you're, you're in a position where you're starting to hear from your guides, you've heard stories from your father, mm -hmm. so at what point were you actually sort of convinced that possibly what he was seeing was, was real and that, and those, those personages started to be appearing for you or become real for you? They never quite, like, appeared to me in the way my dad did. But it just started, like what I was sharing with in school about being told I was stupid, it, it stayed like that until, you know, that was my paradigm, that's what everybody saw me as, until one day it dawned on me that, you know, someone's opinion of me doesn't have to be my reality. And when that happened, everything shifted. Nobody saw me as stupid anymore, but it doesn't mean I still don't have that part. Like, these are all facets of what makes us human, so I couldn't really judge anybody anymore because I, I saw myself in each one of them, no matter what they did. And um, what really took it to the next level, actually, was... Um, this is very, very hard to share, but it's very important to share. Um, even though I was starting to become open to it, I was still very upset with my dad because what I wanted more than anything was just a normal dad and um, to be a father and not to be lost to this world even though it was exciting. Um, you're still a child and you need that kind of support. So I might get a bit emotional about saying this. That's okay. Um, on Christmas Day, the whole family was around and I just felt so hurt and upset by my dad that I told him, I hate you, why don't you just die already? And he did. 
Okay. Um, and when I, you say he, he did, can you be a little more specific as to how, what happened? A week later, he had a brain hemorrhage, and he went in for brain surgery, and he didn't recover. Okay. Um, so how did you f sort of view that? experience? Well, I knew about how our thoughts create reality before what the bleep came out. Um, this information was being given to me by my dad's beings as I sat, you know, and listened to what they were saying. Um, that I knew that there is a huge responsibility to what we're putting out and how powerful it is that, in a sense, it is magic. Mm -hmm. So when I said that, I was so racked with guilt. Um, and so mad at myself and so upset with these beings who are working with me. I felt that they chose the wrong person to do this mission because I demonstrated myself as unworthy that you get told that this is the power that you have. Your thoughts create you know, your reality. Pay attention to them and then you go and do something like that in a so seeming unconscious measure. Okay, but did you also allow for the freedom of the other person, their, their sort of so, as a sovereign entity? In other words, that person being your father, having a choice on whether to die or not? I didn't see that until later on. See, what happened was I didn't want anything to do with the beings after that. I, just because I, I felt so hurt by what I did that I, like, unworthy, like I said. So, but they still wouldn't leave me alone and... Um, they said, you don't understand, you're only seeing it from one perspective, you know, and you're feeling um, very hard on yourself and it's not necessary. You don't understand on the soul level what's occurring. Um, even though you told him out of anger what you told him, on the soul level, you said, it's okay, Dad, you can go now, mm -hmm. we'll be fine. And that I had a contract with him that I would help him go when the time came and that he did want to leave, but he didn't want to go unless he knew that we would be okay. And I did just that. Okay. So you were able to kind of forgive yourself um, and allow for that occurrence to, to happen in, and, and to have been part of your reality, in other words. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and what about your, the rest of your family? Um, how did they view his passing at that point? Devastated my mother. My mother still hasn't recovered from it. Um, my oldest brother just distanced himself away from the family. Like, has he witnessed that? He, I don't know if he even forgives me to this day of what I said to dad, because he can't understand or see it the way I do now. Um, my other brother, he... Um, wasn't he was upset with dad too so he, he actually want, uh, talked about um, mm, you know just not being happy with mom being with dad and uh, Steve was too young to really know what was going on okay so your father passed on and you were having some interactions with various beings and getting information yeah but what happened after that? Um, Did it increase? Did you? Oh yes, it just kept increasing nonstop. I just had to keep. Um, I felt very, very guided suddenly after my dad passed away that he planted a whole bunch of seeds within me, and um, I needed to take care of all these seeds now. I need to make sure they had light and and water and. Um, were you sharing your experiences with your family, or were, was this just private? I could only really share it with my mother. The other uh, siblings didn't, were not open to it at all. Hmm. Um, and what about school friends, schoolmates? No, uh, there was nobody I had at that time, so uh, that's why I went on the computer trying to find people who, somebody must have had similar experiences. Someone must know about this. It can't, I can't be the only one, not just my family. Um, I mean, these videos, you know, they, David Icke, Alex Collier, they, you know, talk to other people, they find them, so perhaps I can do the same. And how many people is this happening to who feel alone, you know, who can't share this because they feel, you know, crazy or they won't be understood, and um, that's really sad and not fair. You know, we have a right to share and express what is within us. 
So that really drove me, and I spent many nights trying to find others to no avail, until one night I um, collapsed in front of the computer, and when I woke up, there, in the, it was in the middle of the night too, there was this only computer screen that's just like, meet other star seeds and light workers. I was like, oh. I hit the mother load. And uh, I contacted them all, and they, we immediately had a strong connection, like we've known each other all our lives. And I just knew so much about them, and I didn't really know how, but I, it just was so strong. And um, it became very exciting, and I decided I wanted to go and see them. And so I just started to... Um, I kind of freaked my mother out because the first one I wanted to meet was, of all things, a guy. Um, one, well, you know, male around my age, and we think that if they're if they're open to this information, that they might they must be the one kind of thing. They're near your age, opposite sex. It's all you need. Um, so I told my mom I'm going to France to meet this guy I've never met, but I'm in love with, and uh, I'm I'm going even though I know that it's going to cost about like everybody's telling me three grand you know, minimum. I said, I'm going to go for less than 900 And I did. I, I, when I called the travel agent, she said, we have uh, nothing available. Oh, except this. this it just popped up. Uh, it looks like somebody canceled uh, for three weeks for, uh, what was it now, 850 Yeah. I'm like, that was the one. That's the one. So. Okay. And you've also done this now. You've sort of followed this kind of pattern since then. Yes. In allowing things to come to you and yes. knowing, sort of having a second sense about that, is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah, it, um, just a strong trusting. The guidance um, just directs you. It's, it's like the white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. Okay. That's what it feels like. So you just know what to do and that you'll be fine. You know, when you can make it happen, you, I can use all of this stuff that I've been taught to reverse uh, a lot of the... Um, old condition programming that is put on us at, when we're younger, right? And um, it's like, it's NLP in a sense. Programming your old beliefs and your, uh, if they're yours or where they came from and uh, using them to step into your power more and more and seeing what you can do if these beings say that we're infinite, you know, and that we're these beautiful balls of light then I want to experience this, I want to feel this. And um, you can't just read about it, you have to embody it, is what I've come to realize. I'm not praying or wishing or hoping for peace and love anymore, I've decided to become it. You know, there, it comes to a point in life where you decide, do you want to go home or become home? And then will that bring home to everybody within? That's what the shift feels like to me. What I was wondering now, if you could talk a little bit about the messages that you were getting and the kind of beings that were coming to you, if you could describe them, maybe specific ones that have particular meaning for you. Um, well, it's never been quite specific. Like I said, they've always, just when I thought I could pinpoint it, okay, it's a play, no, it would uh, be something different suddenly. So um, it was never quite about uh, attaching, okay, this, this is Jesus, this is um, Buddha. It was never about that. It was about the fusion and merging all of them together and that being God in itself, right? Um, playing all these roles and speaking to us in whatever comfort belief that we had. So that was always my approach and perspective on it, even when um, understanding uh, what these aliens were pieces of ourself as well and so what I started to do was not only test the stuff out of my life and I can I don't mind sharing those experiences because they're quite wild and, and really fun um, especially when people start trying it out for themselves and then calling me up later going oh my goodness so but um, <clears throat> for example what I found with the uh, extraterrestrials is if time doesn't exist, past, present, and future are all existing at the same, same time simultaneously. And this is an illusion. Um, in a sense, time is just a bunch of still frames. And this camera, you know, it's not really moving, it's just a bunch of still frames. Mm -hmm. And it's a trick of the eye 
such as the case with going on within our mind as well, making us perceive, um, then if we've been taught to believe about time linear the way we do now, then that means there is aspects of ourself that is fragmented. Um, so future versions of ourself, depending on the probability of our thinking. So, um, for example, the greys, not saying all greys are like this, but um, when I learned that they actually aren't grey at all, that um, on a crash they dissected them and found that their grey skin was actually our colour. Um, and those big goggles, those big eyes, that's what they were, they were goggles. Uh, they were um, a future version of ourself that, you know, they they feel, when, you, when people feel them, they feel very cold and kind of calculated and it's almost like that version of our, our self of the collective thinking about, um, you know, the desensitization of, of, of war and all this cloning and uh, genetic engineering and um, the chemicals in the air made us a little bit disconnected from who we really were. Because, you know, some people say that they, you know, they don't really feel, they don't have emotions in that sense, and that's an aspect of ourself. And I would wonder why those ones would, if you ask any little kid to draw a picture of an alien, it would always be the greys with the big eyes. And what I got from them was that they came back to kind of prevent us from going down that path. And it sounds very bizarre. How can, you know, something come from the future and come back to us if time travel doesn't even exist? But if an old man has smoked his entire life and he has a hole in his throat because of it, a lot of the times he, they get inspired to go to an elementary school to talk to the kids and say, please don't smoke or you'll end up like me. And that's kind of what I saw with the greys. So then I'm like, now I'm going to play with the other races. What about the reptiles? Why are people seeing reptiles? And for me, everything at first exists within. What happens inside of us gets me reflected outside. There is a war going inside of our mind, hence a war going on outside. Even our body mirrors this in that, what is cancer really but one cell not recognizing another cell is on the same team? And so they fight. Well, that's exactly what you know the Americans and the Iraqis and it's been played out over and over and that's why the Buddhists were always saying, you know, peace of mind, meditation, clarity, because, oh my goodness, I can, I'm going to not go on tangents, i got to watch out for that because okay, I'm getting well, don't excited. Worry. Um, it, it, it has a through line, but what I want to know is when you're talking in this way, are you talking about information that has come to you yes. or the information you've read on the internet? No. Are you putting these two together? No. Um, I, can't, I couldn't really read or study this information that much. Um, more of it just honestly came to me. Um, if I did try to read, I would get other stuff coming to me. It was almost like whoever inspired the person in writing the literature, they were speaking through me. You know, in acting, there's the subtext, reading in between the lines, um, a whole other message behind it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I was always picking up, that I could never read or watch movies the same way as everybody else. I never got what everybody else got. I always got something completely different. I never saw things like everyone else. So, I mean, that's like even with reptiles, I don't see them like everybody else does. I see them as a manifestation within our mind because of the reptilian brain. That's where our ego is and where 90% of the negative self-talk comes from and the repetition and that controlling factor in our mind. And I don't even see the ego as something as bad. I see it as um, something that is desperate for our attention and feels like it has a duty to keep us safe and it's doing a good job, but to the point where now it's making reasons why we need it and now we need protection from the protection, which is mere reflected in our society with our system. You know, it was there for protection. Okay. Now we need protection from that. Even. Um, the Pleiadians, they're another mere uh, reflection of ourself in the future of if we step into our potential, our infinite potential, then we'll have that reality probability manifested for us. So there's all these laid out for us. And it's really up to each one of us by the inner work that we do. And we're responsible. 
Because we are our own self-fulfilling prophecy. That's what humanity okay. is, and they've been but, played. Okay, and On what that. is your view if, you know, in other words, when the, when the entities, um, I, I guess I want to say, when the entities come to you uh -huh. and they give you information, do you just accept it? No, we have a conversation almost like I, I challenge them. I always like to challenge them and uh, uh, play with them um, because that seems to be what really uh, stimulates them coming about uh, in touch with your inner child, you know, and uh, that creativity um, and wanting to understand why they're bringing this about, you know, why are they sharing this, what is your intent behind it, and um, I've been able to filter right away ones that are trying to sway by how they make you feel about yourself and the world around you. Do you feel afraid and that you need to, you know, protect yourself or do you feel more liberated and more compassionate and loving? Okay. And that's so how you can decipher through any message, whatever kind of thing you're watching. Okay. And are you finding that certain beings return to you more than once? Would you recognize them or are you talking about a general, you know, sort of heading, you know, it's called spirit or guides or whatever. I prefer to, to use it. that, even though, yeah, they are the f just facets of myself, you, everybody. Right, but given that they are, if you want to look at it that that way, in terms of, you know, we can always look at the world in that term terminology, but they still have individuality to some degree. But I've never really focused on that. That never really interested me so much because, to me, that seemed to be a bit of a distraction. I mean, if we're thinking about, we argue a lot about Jesus, whether he's real or not, and it really doesn't matter. It was the message that's the bigger picture. So that's always what I paid attention to. And I'm like, well, even Luke Skywalker, he's not real, but boy, does he ins inspire and reach a lot of people. So that was always the way I would get past all this uh, things that just to get right to the focal point for me. Okay. So what did they tell you your mission was? Do you know? Mm. It's when you, it doesn't really exist, when you can't, you know, go out and find a place that says, this is just for Jessica, then it's a little bit challenging. So it was something that they said that I can create. I can create with the pieces of what I'm acquiring, how I see my perspective, to share that with the world. And that is, but don't just talk about it, like be it, and inspire people to find their own truth, um, to not to um, say, you know, you need to believe what I believe because I'm right and everybody else is wrong, but to honor where each one is coming from and to trust themselves that they have those answers within that we don't need to necessarily look and depend on other people for the answers because that's kind of what got us into this mess in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're giving our power away to people or beings that don't necessarily have our best intention in mind. But even that, we should ask, why don't they? Where does that come from? What part of ourself that is so self-destructive that allows us to do this to ourselves? Okay, well, if you were going to talk about the future, and you know, a lot of people are talking about 2012, as you know, and um, what may be going on in the future, mm -hmm. have you been given any visions or dreams of the future or any information about it from the beings that are contacting you? Definitely, um, a lot. Um, I always like to dispense this end of the world kind of a thing, but I can understand why people see uh, or perceiving it as the end of the world because. It's the end of an old way of living, being, and thinking that has been around for quite some time. So to a lot of people who don't have imagination, who can't see beyond that, then to them it's the end. But in actuality, it is something far beyond that um, we've ever dreamed. And in a sense, the best way to understand it is, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And we are going to experience that firsthand with them. Um, these paranormal events, which aren't even paranormal at all, it's just a bleed through of who we actually are coming out in all kinds of different ways, is gonna be more and more frequent. And people are gonna start just recognizing each other. And um, a war cannot continue because we, if I harm you, 
right away I'm gonna feel that pain. So say I punched you in the shoulder, I'm gonna feel it right away in my shoulder. And it's going to freak people out at first because we've never really been, like nobody's really taught this to us in school, you know, it's kind of hush hush, it's taboo in the world, but it's, it's starting to come back, humanity, you know, in their state of amnesia for such a long time. And now just um, awakening to what we've always known. And it's very quantum, it's very multi-dimensional, it's memories not just of past lives, but future lives, multi-dimensional lives, interdimensional lives, lives in between lives. We'll be able to grasp that and understand that. Right now, what's happening is it's just, it's stepping stones that's leading us there. And you can't get attached or box yourself into one belief. There, there are no limits, just beliefs. So you always got to expand on that. Okay, so when you say past lives, future lives, mm -hmm. etc. Have you been given vision of your own past lives, future lives? Or are you saying that this is something that you think is going to be revealed to you eventually? Um, I don't have very many past lives per se because I don't, um, I've not been a uh, human on this planet. Um, mainly I've been a guide working on the etheric. So I, I am here to help people understand their guides and the mechanics of how they work and um, all the ways they're trying to get through to us and um, relay their message. Um, and so that's my past lives. I've had um, one in Atlantis and one in France, so not very many. So I do, it is very bizarre to be in a human body and just getting used to the physical and the matter kind of thing. Um, but it's a, very, a huge honor to be in the physical form on earth at this time. And I've been taken to, and I've seen this lineup of souls that just can't wait to be here on earth at this time. And that's actually why the planet is overpopulated. It's because of the excitement from all the souls um, this planet is like a Harvard University for creators in training. And um, it's one of the greatest honors to be in physical form during this time um, because it's the merge of spirit and matter uh, working together and um, going and having these kind of experiences because it's very different. I mean, I can speak about this other side. I can explain to you how they interpret us. It's almost like we are um, a reality show to them. And uh, what we do affects them as well. It's like a huge ripple effect. It's all a microcosm of a macrocosm as we step into that. Um, Okay, so can you talk about specific events in the future, or is it completely unwritten in your view? Um, it's not necessarily specific events, because it's, again, it's on the collective term, but I just, whenever I think about it or tap into it, I just see a very different world from here. I see people more connecting with nature, um, understanding the wisdom that's there, that, it, you know, that it's never lied to you, nature, and it never will, because it has no gain to, to take power. It has no desire to do anything like that. It just gives abundantly. Um, and we will discover ourselves through that. And it, it's just going to be nothing but beauty, to be honest. There's no doom or gloom or fear or anything like that. And call yourself on that and ask yourself why. Why are you getting that? Where is that coming from? Is that you or is that an outside influence? Okay, and if there was something you could tell people that, you know, because um, we've, we've spent almost an hour with you here mm -hmm. and, and we're going to kind of wrap this up, but if there's something you could tell people that you feel that maybe hasn't been said so far, what would that be? Be aware of what you're projecting out into the world. Constantly be aware of your thoughts and be gentle and kinder to yourself. It's really just that the reason I am here right now sharing is because you hear about the younger generation, that, you know, the crystals and the indigos, but where are they? Well, we're here now, and um, your children, they know all about this, and I'm also inspiring and having, I'm almost like a pioneer that's allowing the other uh, children to come forth and speak and share, but it's not just 
children children it's also each person's inner child and that when we balance and merge our divine masculine and our divine feminine since masculine has been the energy that's ruling the planet for quite some time and now feminine energy is starting to take back its power but no one has been you know put down more than the inner child and it's time for them to uh, step to the plate it even mentions this in a bible only one that possesses the heart of a child may enter the kingdom and a child will lead the way and uh, what I gather from this is a child is like our sunshine that's what we call our children you are my sunshine and when we merge that masculine and feminine within us there is peace then the union happens um, the inner child is birthed and that brings such a bright light within us that when I see the stars it's a mirror of you know the we are light in dark places as well and when these lights all recognize each other we all come together in one then it looks a lot like this uh, the big bright light like the sun or God's sun if you will the return of God's sun and um, the other thing I really wanted to share with is our pers perspective on the Illuminati or any kind of uh, forces that are causing a lot of discord that to understand that humanity is conditioned to believe they're a worthless piece of coal under extreme heat and pressure and the heat and pressure can be perceived as the Illuminati or anything that causes discord uh, what happens to a piece of coal under extreme heat and pressure it becomes a diamond so they're doing us a service and helping us step in and take back our power um, it's the there's a major motivation for us it is alchemy even with um, if humanity is a seed of potential um, and it, in order to grow into its loveliness, it needs a lot of fertilizer dumped on it. Shit. Um, I wanted to also say about the Illuminati that I really see them as a bully in high school, that they are very insecure and very afraid, more so of us than we are of them. And to me, I just see them as the Wizard of Oz, that they're smoke and mirrors, great and powerful, but when you get to the root and the heart of the matter, it's a frail old man behind the curtain. In the sense that I felt that you know everybody who parties and does drugs and things like that is bad and I don't want to converse with them I'm not saying all Christians think like that but that was just the way my headspace was and my interpretation of that so when she passed away and I was listening to her friends speak about her at the funeral they were talking about this wonderful girl that I never got to know because I shut her out because I was very judgmental so right then and there I just vowed to myself that I was never going to judge people by what they did that wasn't who they really were you know it's just experiences that we come here for um, it was a very devastating time when my sister passed away and that it destroyed the family my mother ended up getting worse very bad migraines I mean she had migraines before but they seemed to be more frequent and lasted longer and more severe and my father ended up getting a stroke and family broke apart. My brother went to a university. My other brother went to a foster home. Um, we became homeless. So it was a lot all at once. And um, I, th I think I just became very traumatized. You know, it, it almost didn't seem real. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, when, okay, you told me that your father had a big influence on. Yes your sort of letting ETs communicate with you. Can yes. you talk to me about that story? Yes, right after my sister passed away, my dad said, she's come back, and she started to speak to him. And she, start, she said that um, it's a very exciting time to be alive. Uh, the universe is like a big garden, there's lots of tending to. I've come back to let you know that certain members of the family have been called for a very specific mission. And um, she was like the introduction towards a whole bunch of other beings coming through. So after my sister started coming through the catalyst, then came angels, nature spirits, 
Ascended Masters, extraterrestrials, it just got really, really out there. <laughs> okay, when you say this happened, did this happen to you or did this happen to your father? This happened to my father. Okay. It all happened to my father first. So he was very open talking to you about this. Well, he was really shocked and taken aback, you know, it was exciting and he just had to share with the family because he didn't really, I don't know if he knew what to make of it at that time, but he knew that he needed to share this because it was a big thing to my sister. The interesting thing about that, how um, that she came back was mediums can only speak to um, people who've passed away if uh, they haven't crossed over. Mm -hmm. She had crossed over and then she came right back. Okay, when you say she came right back, what do you mean by that? Do you mean she was reincarnated in another body and, and coming to you from there? Or do you mean that she was in another dimension? She was in another dimension. Okay. Yes. Um, the fifth. And my dad described her as very, very bright white light being appeared to him like an angel. And he said it, it was very much her personality because she's like, look, Dad, don't I look pretty? <laughs> like a girl would say. So, uh -huh. yeah, it was you know, something you got to share, it's something really amazing happened. Okay, and what was your reaction when your father talked about this? I was very hurt, very upset because she's passed away, you know, it's like jump, dumping salt on this wound, you know, it's ah, not very funny at all, Dad. You know, particularly because he had a stroke. And when he had the stroke, he didn't know who we were. He couldn't work, you know. I felt like I lost my father and so now to talk about something like this, you know, you're crazy, you don't know what So he had about. these experiences after he had the stroke, is what you're saying? Yes, okay. so I thought. He must have recovered fairly well though, to be able to communicate, I mean, he didn't have like speech impairment or anything like that from the stroke. He did, a bit, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. but he was able to communicate this to you? Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you rejected it in the beginning um, what made you change your mind? A lot of things. Uh, it was okay. not something that I was going to quickly be open to because I really, really wanted to be normal. <laughs> and it was never going to happen. Okay. I just had to. It took me a while to get to that. But um, he wanted to tell me about his experiences and all these beings that were coming through and what they were saying. And they were talking a lot about me. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I did not know what to think of this. I really, really wanted nothing to do with it. And so I would just go to the library or the bookstore and um, books would start falling off the shelf with the same kind of context of information that um, these beings were speaking to my dad about. They'd fall right at my feet. And again, I was still very Christian thinking, so I'm like, this is a devil. So I would just run out, freaked out. and. Um, it's funny how, how did you get over that, though, if you, were such, if you had this mindset that was Christian thinking? How did you sort of move beyond that? Oh, I'll get into that. That's okay. coming up. Um, so I would just, you know, go walking down on the streets and people would come up to me, people I knew and people I didn't know, and they would hand me the books. Again, same kind of information, that would, like the ones that my dad was talking about, similar to the context of the books in the uh, library and bookstore. And uh, what's interesting about this is some of the people, when I asked, why are you giving me this book, of, you know, and they're like, I don't know. How do you not know why you're giving somebody a book unless you're being inspired? Okay. And uh, I still would not look at the books. Um, and so it required those beings to be even more persistent. I like to call it angelic kick in the butt where um, I was working, I've been working in the film industry right after my sister passed away. I left school because um, my parents Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and today we are here with Jessica Schaub. Is that how you say your name? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, Jessica is a crystal child, is what she calls herself, mm -hmm. and we're really excited to be able to talk to her today. Um, 
So Jessica, tell me a little bit about yourself and um, kind of a little bit about your journey. And she's had a very interesting time growing up. And at this time, you're about almost 26. Is that right? Yes. OK. That's correct. OK. So why don't you tell me, um, like, when you, like, the early childhood kind of thing with the relationship with your father and how you sort of tapped into all of this? All right. Um, I was very, very shy growing up. I actually didn't fit in, surprisingly. Um, I didn't really have friends, but uh, my age, I actually did have a lot of grannies, which um, I adopted. I had 50, and they taught me how to knit 10 crochet and things like that. Um, I, am, I retreated a lot into cartoons, and um, it really came about when I was 16. That was the big um, trigger, if you will. Before that, though, I do remember saying things in school like angels are aliens and aliens are angels. But um, So you would say this in school? Yes. And, and what would be the reaction to the children around you? Oh, laughter, ridicule, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why would you say that? You know what? I really didn't know. Okay. Uh, it was almost like um, channeling, but I wasn't aware I was channeling. Okay. I just started sharing this information, and it was even before I even knew what was going on with my father. So, uh, just thinking back to it, that's kind of interesting and different. Uh huh. Okay. So, what happened then? I mean, I mean, obviously, this is what you did on the early days. How did you progress at that point? Because I know there's a part in which you actually kind of tried to reject that world. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, because when you first get into this information, it brings about an existential breakdown. You let go of everything you think you know about yourself and the world and everybody. So it is, in a sense, a little bit of a death and also um, a rebirth. You're an empty cup now, an empty vessel to be filled. Be a little more specific in terms of your, your experience because parents, they were just, you know, they weren't able to um, work. So I decided that, you know, we go to schools, learn how to make money. Um, I'm out of school, I'm out of this. And I went into the film industry right away. Um, my very first day of extra work, I got lines. And so I thought that was normal. <laughs> the next day I'm like, when do I get my lines? And they're like, you don't. So, <laughs> um, where is, where is I so what that? happened? You, um, what did you do then? You didn't get lines. Are you saying you just became an extra? I did extra work. I mm -hmm. did acting. I did stunts. I did stand-in. I did crew work, um, okay. set deck. I mm -hmm. did as many different things um, to remove um, politics and understand where everybody was coming from. That was something that I always was interested in doing is learning all the different perspectives. and. Um, OK. and. So when did the transition happen where you started to listen to what your father said? On set, on a show called Da Vinci's Inquest, a guy came up to me I've never seen in my entire life. And he said to me, is your name Jessica? And I said, mm-hmm. He said, is your last name Shaw? Yeah. And um, is your parents' name Roseanne and Terry? Yeah. How do you know all this? And he's like, okay. This is for you. And he gave me all these tapes on the CIA, underground militia, David Icke, Jordan Maxwell, Alex Collier, and then some. <laughs> okay. And um, it, I just kind of realized that this is never going to let up. Something is trying to get my attention, and I have to surrender. Did you watch those tapes? I did. Okay. And did it change you? Um, I became very, very depressed, even more so, because, again, letting go of everything you think you know, but then also it seems to be this huge, scary conspiracy, like we're doomed, it's, you know, this huge control game going on and there's nothing you can do about it because you don't have the power or the money or um, say, in a sense. Okay. Yeah. And so, what did you do then? How did you... How did you go from there to actually listening to your father? Well, after the videos and after feeling the way I did about them and just constant reoccurring of um, 
Pleiadians, you know, okay, Dad, who are the Pleiadians? Why do they want to get in contact with me? So I started finding out now, really listening to my dad. And I wasn't necessarily open to it, but I wasn't necessarily closed. I was just thinking that um, this is my experience for whatever reason life has taken this turn, and um, it's for a reason. So I should, um, I should do some investigating. Okay, and how I know that, that you had a tragedy in, your, in mm -hmm. your life, but prior to that, because that happened kind of like in your late teens, yes. you had sort of a dilemma. So can you describe what your father was like and why and how that dilemma kind of came around in your life? Um, he was very distant. He um, was connected to a world that I wasn't familiar with at the time, and he spoke about things that I really didn't understand also. Um, but he was, you know, very, very, like, passionate and loving as well. But, um, sorry, I'm getting a little nervous. Um, well, I can, also, I can say beforehand, I was always a little bit suspicious in school. Um, I felt like I didn't like being taught what to think rather than how to think. That was always in the back of my mind. And um, also just, I kind of felt like I was coming off the assembly line. And... Um, I remember trying to um, uh, ask about things that I, I noticed that there's just stuff I was, we weren't being taught about in school. For example, um, in grade eight, they were saying the only kind of matter is gas, solid, and liquid. And I raised my hand and I said, well, what about plasma? And you know what she said? Go to detention. Go to detention, really? Yeah. So. Um, Very interesting. Yeah. And you grew up in what, what area? Um, well, I was born in Winterpeg, but I left when I was seven. Mm -hmm. And um, the Vancouver area, the suburbs. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so you were told to go <laughs> to detention because you talked about plasma. Yes. And that's, you know, actually, I mean, so they, they actually didn't have any clue about that. And we're talking what year it, uh, approximately? Do you remember? I was in um, grade eight, yes. Okay. First year of high school. Okay. And I just started to realize, wait a second here, there's a lot they're not saying, and why can't we talk about it? Why do we get in trouble if we bring this stuff up? Okay. Right? So, so what happened after that? Um, I kind of disregarded it. Like, I didn't really pay too much attention to it. It was just always in the back of the brain. And it's almost like um, a detective. You're collecting all these bits and pieces as you go on the way, and um, still very blind. So we always, we have a trigger. And my trigger was when I was 16. Um, it was tragedy. My sister ended up passing away. And um, her friend was drinking and driving. And it was just my sister that went. So it was just her time. And OK, and how did that affect you? I mean, obviously, you know, it's distressing. And, and we don't have to dwell on it here, but at the same time I think that it has something to do with your willingness to perhaps let in these other worlds. Would you say that? Yes, because I realized that um, I was very depressed at that time, and I was also very um, Christian thinking.